thing. I ought to say why I think it ought to be credited. And I ought to add that my colleagues Richard Dawkins and Daniel Dennett have been very generous in this respect. This debate would be uninteresting if religion was one-dimensional. Religion was our first attempt to make sense of our surroundings. It was our first attempt at cosmology, for example, to make sense of what goes on in the heavens. It was our first attempt at what I care about the most, the study of literature and literary criticism. It, it gave us texts to deliberate and even to debate about, even if some of those texts were held to be the word of God and beyond review and beyond criticism, nonetheless the idea is introduced and it had never been introduced before. Um, it's our first attempt at healthcare in one way. If you, if, uh, you go to the shaman or the witch doctor uh, and you make the right propitiations, the right sacrifices, and you really believe in it, you do have a better chance of recovery. Everybody knows it's a medical fact. Morale is an ingredient uh, in health. And it was our first attempt at that too. It was our first very bad attempt at human solidarity because it was tribe-based, uh, but nonetheless it taught that there were virtues in sticking together. And it was our first attempt, I would say also, this is not an exhaustive list, at psychiatric care, at dealing with the terrible loneliness of the human condition, at what happens when the individual spirit looks out shivering into the enormous void of the cosmos and contemplates its own extinction and deals with the awful fear of death. This was the first attempt to apply any balm to that awful question. But, as Charles Darwin says of our own evident kinship with lower mammals and lower forms of life, we bear, as he puts it in The Origin of Species, we, we, we bear always the ineffaceable stamp of our lowly origin. I'll repeat it, the ineffaceable stamp of our lowly origin. Religion does the same thing. It quite clearly shows that it's the first, the most primitive, the most crude, and the most deluded attempt to make sense. It is the worst attempt but partly because it was the first. So the credit can be divided in that way. And the worst thing it did was to offer us certainty, to say these are truths that are, are unalterable, they're handed down from on high, we only have to learn God's will and how to obey it in order to free ourselves from these dilemmas. That's probably the worst advice of all. Heinrich Heine says that if you're in a dark wood on a dark night, and you don't know where you are, and you've, nev you've never been through this territory before, you may be well advised to hire as a guide the local mad, blind old man who can feel his way through the forest, because he can do something you can't. But when the dawn breaks and the light comes, you would be silly if you continued to operate with this guide, this blind, mad old man who was doing his best with the first attempt. To give you just two very contemporary examples, to have a germ theory of disease relieves you of the idea that plagues are punishments, that the church used to preach, that plagues come because the Jews have poisoned the wells, as the church very often preached, or that the Jews even exist and are themselves a plague, as the church used to preach when it felt strong enough and also was morally weak enough and had such little evidence. Uh, you can free yourself from the idea that diseases are punishments or visitations. If you study plate tectonics, you won't do what the Archbishop of Haiti did the other day, speaking to his sorrowing people after his predecessor had been buried in the ruins of the cathedral at Port-au-Prince, along with a quarter of a million other unfortunate Haitians whose lives were miserable enough as it was, and to say, with the Cardinal Archbishop of New York standing next to him, that God had something to say to Haiti, and this is the way he chose to say it. If you study if you study plate techno tectonics and a few other things, you will free yourself of this appalling burden from our superstitious, fearful primate past. And I suggest, again, to an institution of higher learning, that's a responsibility we all have to take on. If we reflect, some people say the great Stephen Jay Gould, who I, I admired very much, for whom we all learned a great deal about evolutionary biology, used to say, rather leniently, I think, that, well, these are non-overlapping magisteria, the material world, the scientific world, and the faith world. I think non-overlapping is too soft. I, I think it's more a question, really, increasingly, of it being a matter of incompatibility, or perhaps better to say, <clears throat> irreconcilability. Just if you reflect on a, a, a few things I'll have time, I hope, to mention.
My timer, by the way, isn't running, so I'm under your discipline, Professor. Um, no, you'll give me... Very good. Um, when we reflect that the rate of expansion of our universe is increasing, it was thought until Hubble that we knew it was expanding, but that surely Newton would teach us that the rate would diminish. No, the rate is increasing. The Big Bang is speeding up. We can see the, the end of it coming increasingly clearly, and while we wait for that, we can see the galaxy of Andromeda moving nearer towards the collision that's coming with us. You can see it now in the night sky. This is the object of a design, you think? What kind of designer in that case? To say that the, the, this must have an origin, and now we know how it's going to end, why ask whether, why there's something rather than nothing when you can see the nothingness coming? Only replaces the question. Faith is of no use in deciding it. And that's on the macro level. From the macro to the micro, 99.8% of all species ever created, if you insist, on the face of this planet have already become extinct, leaving no descendants. I might add that of that number, three or four branches of our own family, Homo sapiens, branches of it, the Cro-Magnons, uh, the Neanderthals, who were living with us until about 50,000 years ago, who had tools, who made art, who decorated graves, uh, who clearly had a religion, who must have had a god, who must have abandoned them, who must have let them go. They're no longer with us. We don't know what their last cries were like. And our own species was down to about 10,000 in Africa before we finally got out of there, unforsaken this time or so far, <clears throat> to move from the macro, in other words, to the micro. Our own solar system is only halfway through its allotted span before it blows up. And as Sir Martin uh, Ryle, the great astronomer Royal and professor of cosmology at Cambridge, and incidentally a believing Anglican, says, by the time there are creatures on the Earth who look as the sun expires, they will not be human. It will not be humans who see this happen if our planet lives that long. The creatures that watch it happen will be as far different from us as we are from amoebae and bacteria. Faced with these amazing, overarching, titanic, I would say awe-inspiring facts, like the fact that ever since the Big Bang, every single second, a star the size of ours has blown up. While I've been talking, once every second, a star the size of our sun has gone out. Faced with these amazing, indisputable facts, can you be brought to believe that the main events in human history, the crucial ones, happened 3,000 to 2,000 years ago in illiterate desert Arabia and Palestine? And that it was at that moment only that the heavens decided it was time to intervene and that by those interventions we can ask for salvation. Can you be brought to believe this? I stand before you as someone who quite simply cannot and who refuses furthermore to be told that if I don't believe it, I wouldn't have any source for ethics or morality. Please don't pile the insulting onto the irrational and tell me that if I don't accept these sacrifices in the desert, I have no reason to tell right from wrong. One minute. One minute, good. Um, <clears throat> <clears throat> then I'll have to prune and you'll be the losers. But I'll have a, there's a rebuttal coming. All right, look at the contemporary religious scene. I return to religion as well as just faith and, and belief. Israeli settlers are stealing other people's land in the hope of bringing on the Messiah and a terrible war. On the alternative side, as it thinks of itself, the Islamic jihadists are preparing a war without end, a faith-based war based on the repulsive tactic of suicide murder. And all of these people believe that they have a divine warrant, a holy book, and the direct word of God on their side. We used to worry when I was young, what will happen when a maniac gets hold of a nuclear weapon? We're about to discover what happens when that happens. The Islamic Republic of Iran is about to get a nuclear weapon, and by illegal means that flout every possible international law and treaty. Meanwhile, in Russia, the authoritarian, chauvinistic, expansionist regime of Vladimir Putin is increasingly decked in clerical garb by the Russian Orthodox Church with its traditional allegiance to Tsarism serfdom and the rest of it. And Dinesh would have to argue, I'll close on this, Dinesh would have to argue that surely that's better than there be a mass outbreak of secularism in Russia and Iran and Israel and Saudi Arabia. 
And I would call that a reductio ad absurdum. And I'll leave you with it, and I'll be back. Thanks. <laughs>